Did you know this controversial dress is now involved in an attempted murder case? Eight years ago, this dress went viral online. It caused controversy because people were arguing whether it was blue and black or white and gold. It was actually around the wedding of Kia Johnston and his wife Grace that the dress initially sparked the debate. Grace's mum had sent her daughter a picture of the dress to ask if she should wear it to the wedding. They then started debating what the colour of the dress actually was. A guest at the wedding then posted the picture of the dress to Tumblr and the whole world got involved. The couple even went on the Ellen show to discuss it. However, Kier is now accused of attempting to murder his wife. He's been accused of DV over a period of 11 years. It's alleged that he tried to strangle her, threatened to kill her and threatened her with a knife. Do you notice something kind of off about this mannequin? For anyone who's familiar with the legend, she is known as La Pascualita. The mannequin has stood in the window of a Mexican bridal shop for more than 90 years, but when she was first placed there, patrons noticed something kind of strange. The detail work on this mannequin was unusual. She was noted with eyebrow hair, veins, and even discoloration around her mouth and ears. But that suspicion soon grew to horror as patrons started to notice that she bore a striking resemblance to the owner's deceased daughter, Pascuela. Pascuela was actually actually set to be married herself, but ended up dying in a tragedy before her wedding day. Shortly after her death, the mannequin appeared in the window and the legend was born that these were the preserved remains of the owner's daughter. But the most compelling evidence has always been the hands. The hands are shown with wrinkles, they have veins, they even have lifelike fingernails, which is unlike any mannequin I have ever seen. The question remains to this day, could this really be the shop owner's daughter? Two words, buckle up. 29-year-old Christine Chubek did something on live television that traumatized an entire community. Hi, my name is Ethan and here's everything you need to know in under one minute. Christine was hired at a new station called WXLT-TX and she was later given her own show called Suncoast Digest where she talked about recent crimes. A little bit about her, she was severely depressed and tried to unalive herself in 1970 but failed. She even made several comments on air about taking her own life and her news partner just awkwardly moved on. On the morning of of July 15th, 1974, she confused her co-workers by saying that she had to open up for Suncoast Digest, which she normally did not do. The most immediate and complete reports of local blood and guts news, TV40 presents what is believed to be a television first in living color, exclusive coverage of an attempted suicide. She then drew a weapon, unalived herself, and the broadcast rapidly went black. I don't even have to have a hook for this story as it left me speechless. Hi, my name is Ethan and here's everything you need to know in under one minute. This is 56 year old Billy Davis. On the evening of January 11th, 2023, she was riding the Bloomington Transit bus when an 18 year old girl had got out of her seat to exit. Out of nowhere, Billy got up and then began beating and stabbing the 18 year old girl in the head. As soon as it started, it stopped. Billy then got off the bus and walked away. Thankfully, one of the passengers on the bus did follow Billy and eventually called authorities to let them know where her location was. This is the part that really enraged me. Once in custody, she told police that she wanted to unalive the victim due to her, quote, being Chinese as it would be one less person to blow up the country, end quote. According to reports, she is now facing up to life in prison for attempted murder. After being mistakenly released from prison, I cut out my neighbor's heart and cooked it with potatoes to feed my family. My name is Lawrence Anderson, and this is my story. In 2017, I was given 20 years in prison in Oklahoma for drug charges. However, being the lucky man that I am, I was mistakenly released just four years later, in 2021. Just weeks after being released from prison, I committed one of the most hideous crimes. I broke into the home of my family's neighbor, Andrea Blakenship, and stabbed her over 40 times. I then cut out her eyes, stomach, and heart. I grabbed the heart and took it to my aunt and uncle's house. I cooked it with potatoes and tried to feed Ty to my family. After they refused to eat it, I stabbed my uncle and my four-year-old granddaughter. I then attacked my aunt, but she miraculously survived after being badly injured. I was quickly arrested and confessed to everything. I was given life in prison without the possibility of parole. I killed myself after an 11-year-old girl was rescued at sea. The reason why will have you in shock. My name is Julian Harvey and I am a boat captain. I was the captain for a luxury yacht and was taking a family from Fort Lauderdale, Florida to the Bahamas. 
The first five days of the trip were going great, and I was getting along great with the family. However, on the fifth night something went wrong with the boat, and it began rapidly sinking. I quickly hopped on the dinghy as I watched the boat sink and be fully submerged. A few days later I was alerted that a little girl who was on the yacht when it sank actually survived and was found. After hearing this news I went to my motel room and ended my life. Why you may ask? Well that's because I lied to the Coast Guard. You see on the fifth night of the trip I drowned and stabbed the entire family on the yacht except for the little girl. When I got on the dinghy I assumed she would drown as the ship was almost fully underwater. Now that she was alive I knew the truth of the story would come to light. I could not handle the situation and ended my life. Follow for more stories. My parents gave me cocaine, and then I shot my 16-month-old brother. I am a five-year-old boy who lives in Indiana, and this is my story. My brother and I had an extremely close bond. Since the day he was born, I have spent a ton of time hanging out, playing, and cuddling with him. I am so glad that I get to be his older brother and lead him as he grows up. One day in March of 2023, I was at home with my brother and my dad. My parents did a lot of drugs and would sometimes let me and my younger brother have some. I got a little bit of cocaine in my system and I began to feel very crazy and rowdy. That's when I went searching for my parents' gun. I saw my dad was asleep in his bed and I snuck around him and then I found it and then walked into my baby brother's room. He was sound asleep. I raised the gun at him and shot him once. He passed instantly and my father ran into the room and called the authorities. Police cars and ambulances showed up, but there was no saving my little bro. Both of my parents were arrested and charged with felony child neglect. If I could go back, I would not have done what I did, but my mind was tainted with substances I shouldn't have had access to. Follow for more stories. I had one pizza delivery left before I got off shift, but little did I know this would be the last delivery of my life, and the reason why will have you shocked. My name is Jeremy Giordano. I am a 22-year-old pizza delivery driver in New Jersey. On a late Saturday night in 1997, we got a delivery call to an address in a not-so-great part of town. A part of town with a lot of violence, robberies, and more. In fact, 95% of the pizza places refused to deliver to that area because of the dangers. However, my pizza parlor did, in fact, deliver there. At around 10.30 at night I began to drive to the address and after about 20 minutes of driving I arrived to this old rundown home. None of the lights were on and it looked abandoned, but the customer came out to my car and approached my passenger side window to get the pizzas. That's when him and his friend opened fire on me and shot me over and over until I passed. A motorist found my body about an hour later and called police. After an investigation, the police found two young boys guilty of murder. But not only of me, they had done the same to another delivery driver that night. They said their motivation for the killings were because they wanted to see what it felt like. Follow for more stories. If I didn't know this was a true crime case, I would think it was a disturbing horror film. On the morning of the 7th of October 2022, a barefoot woman was running around Excelsior Springs, Missouri, bashing on people's doors. Witnesses describe her looking like she came straight from a horror film and she was calling for help. She'd been beaten, held captive, and SA'd for weeks. The woman was a shocking sight. She was covered in injuries and was wearing a bin bag. Disturbingly, she was gasping for breath as she had a very tight metal collar locked around her neck. It was a nurse who opened the door to her and let her come in. The nurse started to call police and at this point the woman panicked. She warned her that the captor would kill her and claimed that he had killed her two friends. When police got there, the woman explained that a man called Timothy had captured her the month prior. He'd been holding her hostage this whole time. She said he'd been keeping her locked in the basement and had been SAing her. Disturbingly, she told police that he actually had a young son who lived at the house with him. When Timothy had taken his young son to school the one day, she used it as her opportunity to escape. Police made their way to the home of 39-year-old Timothy Hazlitt Jr. and found the property did in fact have a basement like the woman described. Timothy was arrested and is facing nine charges, including first-degree kidnapping. He's being held on a $3 million bond and faces five life sentences. Before his arrest, police were actually called to his address three times. Twice they were asked to do welfare checks and this was from an employer and also family members. Police have searched his home with cadaver dogs and they haven't yet released what they know. Audrey used the remaining time to pack enough air for the three and a half minute dive. 
A kiss from Pepin, and Audrey took her final breath. I was keeping pretty careful track of the time, as I always do. I suppose I was 20 meters from the dive boat in a little skiff. I'm holding the line, and Pepin was doing the same also from the water, because we get to feel the vibration coming from the sled, just going under and brushing against the cable. So we have a way to determine more or less what's going on. When I look at Pepin, it was as if something was just not right. But on the other hand, nothing was wrong. doy la señal de que están 80 metros y ya pasó por delante de mí que estaba iba bien perfecto I had the feeling something was not right before she hit the bottom it takes decades of experience but if you look at a line you can see how it's oscillating in the water column this can be caused by current but it also be caused by the tension on the line and the fluctuating tension on the line. And it just didn't look quite right. A minute and a half into the dive, to tell Audrey she was nearing the 170 meter mark, Pascal clanged his pipes. I saw Audrey arriving like usual, you know, fast. At one minute and 42 seconds, Audrey's sled reached the bottom of the line. And then uh, the first bad surprise, when she finished to open this tank, which was uh, supposed to, to fill the lift bag, uh, nothing happened. Sorry. I'm sorry, bud. Do you mind if I talk to her again? Okay, I'm going to bring um, Kyle in here with you, okay? okay. This is 16-year-old Kyle Hooper, Amber Wright's half-brother. He's just finished a grueling one-on-one -on -one interview with a detective and is clearly distressed. All your kids are in a thing for murder. Amber, too? Yeah. What do you mean? Well, we told you it wasn't a storm. I mean, it was, like, everything was planned. Approach everybody? Everybody. Admitting that everything was planned is extremely important because it proves mens rea, premeditated criminal intent. So not only has Kyle essentially admitted to murder on videotape, he's also admitted to a specific degree of murder, first degree murder. We're, we're caught. They took my phone. Everything's gone. James and I too. On what? Now Kyle has also unexpectedly implicated his stepfather, James Havens III, stating that he is in on it too. Kyle Hooper, much like his sister, has told detectives a bit of a story while his mother was present. However, they likely realize at this point that he is the weakest link, as he was the one who originally confessed to his mother. He certainly doesn't seem to want to tell the full story in front of her. So the detective pulls him out into a room alone, where he sits wiping ink from his hands from his fingerprinting. Little does he know, a confrontation is about to begin. So, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I want to be perfectly honest with you, okay? This is how, this is how I work. I'm giving you an opportunity right now to lie to me. Okay? If you take that opportunity, okay, you're a fool. No, I'm not lying to you at all. Everything that comes out of your little mouth right now better be 110% the truth, okay? All right, now let's start back at the beginning of this. And this is your one and only last chance to correct any discrepancies you may have of the story that you told me, okay? Want to start fresh? Man, I'm scared. Kyle, I'm sure you are. 
Okay? Yep. I, I, I don't want to go. I don't want to go through all this. This next case will shock you. Let me introduce you to Erica and Shanita. This is Erica Mae Butts and Shanita Latrice Cunningham. The couple is facing charges for the death of Serenity Richardson at a Charleston courtroom in North Carolina. In 2009, a three-year-old girl, Serenity Richardson, was found dead. The cause of death was determined to be at the hands of her very own godmother, Erica, and her lover, Shanita. Serenity was on a two-week holiday to Erica's house when the incident happened. The court heard that this was not the first time the woman had laid their hands on Serenity. In fact, they often had the help of a belt and plastic coat hangers. Every part of Serenity showed signs of abuse, well, except for the soles of her feet. When she became unresponsive, they tried to revive her with bleach and ice, but she was already dead by the time the medics arrived. The women claimed that Serenity had a potty incident and that they didn't know that what they did would result in her death. As if the abuse wasn't bad enough, the drama that happened in the court made the case even more touching. The trial was a highly emotional affair, and when Judge Deidre Richardson read their sentence, the two women collapsed, screamed uncontrollably, and hyperventilated. Court officials had to pick them up off the floor and wheel them out of the room. Butt's mother also had to be physically thrown out by three court officials after shouting at her daughter to get up. Prosecutor Elizabeth Gordon noted that this was the worst case she had seen in four years of prosecuting crimes against special victims. Erica and Shanita were both found guilty of murder and will spend the rest of their lives in prison. However outrageous you think Erica and Shanita's case and reaction was, it wasn't compared to that of Michael Madison. This is Michael Madison, who is charged with murder in Cleveland. Madison was an American convicted serial killer and sex offender from East Cleveland, Ohio. The story of Michael is not for the faint of heart. In 2013, Michael was arrested for the murders of at least three women over a nine-month period in 2012 and 2013. Michael was born on October 15, 1977, to Diane Madison and John Baldwin. He was the product of an accidental pregnancy, and his father denied that he was his son and had no contact with him. Michael had a tough life growing up. He had a severely abusive mother, and her boyfriends also abused him. Michael later admitted that he had mixed feelings over his mother's death. On July 19, 2013, the police received reports of a foul odor coming from a garage leased to Michael. When they investigated, is Jaleel Smith Riley, who is facing charges for murder in Michigan. Smith Riley was involved in an armed robbery on November 16th, 2013 in Norwood, where he and two other men approached a parked car. Inside the parked car was 20-year-old Portia Brooks and her boyfriend, Aaron Martin. Smith Riley knocked on the window with a handgun and forced Martin, who was in the passenger seat, out of the car. Jaleel then proceeded to go through Aaron's pockets and demanded his cash. Once Jaleel had taken every dollar Aaron had, he then took his life with a shot to the head, causing permanent brain damage. However, Jaleel wasn't done there. 
Right after shooting Aaron, he then leaned into the car and fired at Brooks, who was sitting in the car, twice. And she died three days later. Fortunately, Martin survived the shooting, but sustained serious injury. Before the judge announced the sentence that Jaleel would be facing, Portia's family got the chance to address the jury and the man who took their daughter away from them. Sharon Brooks, Portia's mother, brought the box containing her daughter's ashes to the courtroom, as she had for previous court dates. She stated that Smith Riley had ruined her life and killed her identity as a mother of three. This is what I have left because of his greed, his selfishness, his complete disregard of and disrespect of others and life. But as you can see, I get nothing back except the reality that she is gone. Tia Marie Brooks, Portia's sister, also spoke emotionally and requested that Smith Riley be handed the maximum sentence. I have to deal with life without Portia, so he should deal with life without, without parole. Then, Aaron, who Jaleel shot in the head, spoke to the court. Well, she's still here with us, and, and she will always be here. So, this is my, she's our angel looking over us, helping us get through these hard times. As if Smith Riley's crime was not outrageous enough, his reaction to his sentence was even more dramatic. During the trial on August 11th, 2021, Smith Riley pleaded guilty to aggravated murder and attempted murder. However, he later decided to withdraw his guilty plea against the advice of his attorneys. Well, from the beginning, this was an emotional day for the families of both of these victims. But when Smith Riley decided to reverse his plea halfway through the sentencing hearing, they were shocked. And his attorneys were, too, in part because it puts the death penalty back on the table. Prior to receiving his sentence, Jaleel was heard apologizing in court as what appeared to be a last attempt at showing remorse. <laughs> Additionally, Jaleel's attorney made a final attempt at saving face. And he knows that he can't go back in time and not do what he did. Despite the tears and the apologies, Judge Charles Kubicki, presiding over the case in Hamilton County Common Pleas Court, denied Smith Riley's request and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The 23-year-old monster that is currently rotting behind bars collapsed to the floor of the courtroom upon receiving his sentence. Smith Riley also received an additional sentence of 11 years for a related attempted murder charge. However bad you think Smith Riley's case was, can't be compared to the infamous case of T.J. Lane. This is T.J. Lane, who's facing charges for multiple murders in Ohio. T.J. Lane was a convicted American murderer who gained notoriety after committing a horrific crime at Chardon High School in Ohio. On February 27, 2012, the Ohio Police Department responded to multiple calls from teachers and students that there was an active shooter in the building. TikTok captures this 16-year-old's final moments before she was killed. In the video, Calicia Williams appears startled and abruptly ends the video when someone seemingly enters the room. She was staying at the Hyatt Regency on December 26th for what her family thought was going to be a chaperoned holiday party. She was fatally shot and a teenage boy has since been arrested in connection to her death. The TikTok video was made at 12.02 a.m and Calicia was pronounced dead at 12.23. Police are still working to piece together exactly what happened within that 21 minute time span. My sister sees people. Uh, when we were kids, uh, she was, when she was little, she was like two and a half, three years old. I used to think that she would run into a room and hide underneath the rug underneath her bed because my dad's friends would always be like, oh my gosh, you're so cute. I want to take you home with me. That's why I thought, and so here I am, her older brother, and I'm eight years old going, you can't say that, that wasn't it. What she found out is like, if you had a, if we were sitting here having this conversation and you just said somebody just passed that you know and whatever, and you got deep into it, she would have to leave the room. You ever wondered what happened to Jackie Kennedy's bloodstained suit after the assassination of JFK? After shots were fired, blood from JFK's injuries seeped into her pink outfit. 
Following the incident, Jackie refused to take off the suit on the way to the hospital and even when she was transported to Washington. Jackie continued to wear the suit even when Vice President Lyndon Johnson was sworn into office. And this was broadcast nationally so everyone could see. Jackie stated that she kept the suit on because she wanted the assassin to see what he had done and that her only regret was wiping her face clean of blood before going on camera. It wasn't until the next morning that she took off the suit. Today, her suit, shoes, stockings, and even handbag remain preserved in the National Archives. And they will remain hidden for nearly a century. In 2003, these items were officially donated by the Kennedy's daughter, Caroline. And at that time, she requested that these items remain hidden for 100 years. Meaning that the suit won't be on display until the year 2103. We're asleep. And she gets up to go to the bathroom. And I'm like, oh man, I have to go to the bathroom too. So I'm going to go to the bathroom in the, the main bathroom right. outside the room. I go out, I come back in, and I'm like, why'd you turn my light on? On my side of the bed. Like, are we get it's well, we're going to bed. Like, we're in bed. She's like, I didn't do it. I thought you did. I'm like, okay, well, somebody's trying to get our attention. My phone rings. It's my little sister. She says, Hey Bob, sorry, are you awake? And I'm like, I am now. <laughs> and I go, my light just came on. She goes, That's why I was calling you. She said, Is Nicole there? I'm like, Yeah. She put her on speaker. She said, Nicole, I don't want to get personal, but um, did your mom have miscarriages before before you? And she's like, yeah. She goes, I'm seeing three people in the room right now trying to get your attention. And they're your, they're your two brothers and your sister that weren't born. On the morning of November 29th, Christine Young suddenly woke up out of a deep sleep feeling a cold sensation come over her. It was exactly 5.45 a.m. and she noticed that her arms and legs were starting to go numb. She thought it was strange, but brushed it off in the moment not knowing what it could have meant. After all, she needed to get some sleep so she could wake up to meet with her daughter later in the morning like they had planned for a while now. But when Christine's daughter Ashley didn't show up for their arranged meeting, she began to worry. She started frantically calling Ashley's phone, but got no response. So she called each one of Ashley's friends to see if they had any idea where she was. This is when she learned that her daughter Ashley had plans to meet up with 30-year-old Jared Chance and hadn't been seen since leaving a local bar with him. A few days later, police receive a disturbing phone call from a concerned neighbor in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This neighbor explains that he's just stumbled upon a tarp with a stream of blood leaking from it. When police arrive, they find that the tarp is wrapped around a human torso. The owner of that apartment? Jared Chance. The DNA of the torso is tested and it comes back that it is human and that it does belong to Ashley Young. Ashley's arms and legs were later found in a box in Jared's apartment. That's when Ashley's mom, Christine, recalls the incident from a few days prior. She believes that at the time she woke up at exactly 5.45 in the morning was the time of her daughter Ashley's death. Unfortunately, Ashley's head has still never been located. How did this woman go from looking like this to looking like this? This is the very heartbreaking case of Sharla Nash. One day in 2009, Sharla received a call from a friend. Her friend's pet chimpanzee named Travis had sadly escaped from the house and was running loose in the neighborhood. Now, Sharla had known this chimp for years and being as kind as she was, she offered to help lure the chimp back inside. Sharla arrived at her friend's house, not suspecting the danger that awaited her. As she approached Travis, the chimp suddenly turned on her and with the ferocity that is beyond belief, the 200 pound animal mauled her face and hands, causing devastating injuries. In a complete panic, Charlotte's friend made this call. What's the problem? Send the police! Send the police! What's the problem there? The chip killed my friend! When police arrived on scene, the chimp was shot, and Sharla was rushed to hospital where she underwent multiple surgeries, including a face transplant. Despite medical intervention, Sharla did end up losing her hands, her eyes, and her nose in the attack. She was also left completely blind and disfigured. Now this incident completely shook the community. It received widespread media coverage, ultimately raising awareness about the dangers of owning exotic pets. For more Simonson crime stories, remember to follow.